Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. You are listening to a rebroadcast of a previously recorded show. I'm excited to welcome the program author Ted Geltner, author of Blood, and Bone, and Marrow, a biography of Harry Cruz. Ted, thanks for calling. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Neil. Good to be here. Oh, I'm excited to chat with you. And so uh, the first question is an educator because that's my, that's my trade. Uh, who is Harry Cruz? That's the first question. I'm sure a lot of people ask you it based on the title, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you brought up that you're an educator. He also was an educator. He was a writer and a creative writing professor. Um, he was a, a Southern Gothic novelist uh, from the that had his heyday in the 70s and 80s. He was kind of like a uh, like a Southern Hemingway, a hard drinking, hard fighting. Uh, novelist who dug really deep with his work and and um uh came around you know in the in the late 60s and 70s and and was compared with uh Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor and uh and had like a long career then he he um wrote a bunch of novels also uh went into uh journalism and wrote for Playboy and and Esquire and and um hobnobbed with uh with celebrities like Madonna and Sean Penn and and um and uh, had had a long career and uh and wrote into uh, into the late 90s. All right. So, uh when doing your research for the book, was there anything that you that you left out that you wanted to be that you wanted in the book? Um well, you know, there was a lot that I left out. I uh that, you know, he just had such a um a tremendous uh long life with a uh, with ups and downs and just a, a um a great story that that um that just went all the way from when well, he was born um uh on a sharecropper farm in South Georgia so he was uh, grew up during the depression dirt poor and um made his way uh into the marines and then eventually um to the University of Florida uh where he kind of fought his way up and and taught himself uh, through you know uneducated how to be a writer um, so, so I did a lot of research, kind of digging into uh, how that happened and how he um, managed to um, to come from that uh, upbringing uh, into the literary world. So, uh, yeah, there was there was a, there was a lot a lot that um, that I uh, had to, to delve into and find out. Great, thank you for the, the kind of behind the scenes look, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, how did you come up with the idea to interview him? I mean, was it was he someone you followed from you know childhood? Was it someone that you just you know you stumbled upon? Like, what gave you the motivation to to write the story? Well, I first uh, became uh, uh, aware of him, and uh, I guess I knew of him, but uh, I was a newspaper reporter um, in Gainesville, Florida. He was a University of Florida professor. That's where he he taught for thirty years, um, and uh, about twelve years ago. Uh, a film crew came to Gainesville to um, make the first movie based on one of his novels. His novels had been optioned, you know, throughout his uh, his writing career, but they'd never made it to the screen. You know, 30 years of, of unsuccessful screenplays. Anyway, this film crew came and and uh, was gonna act, did actually make a movie called The Hawk Is Dying, starring Paul Giamatti, and I got the story to cover it. And part of that was uh, you had to call Harry. Now Harry Cruz was was a little bit of a uh, a hermit, you know, and he, and, you know, a uh, little bit of an intimidating figure. Um, so I interviewed him for that article and then, uh, you know, a bunch of articles while they were making the movie. Eventually it went to Sundance and I followed it there and I, and I kind of got to know, uh, Harry then and, and, um, uh, did more articles on him, um, and kind of got to be a friend of his and he, you know, he was, he was, uh, in bad, poor health. This is later in his life. And, and, you know, I used to, uh, take him to the dentist and drive him around and uh eventually um you know right uh, in the year or so before he died uh, i got the idea to write this biography and i asked him about it and he said uh he said sure but you better do it quick so <laughs> i ended up uh writing the book on him and and um and that, that's how that all came about and that's that's the history of uh, the, the thing what would you say Having to help him out and seeing his health deteriorate, what, what what was so difficult when writing the book because of the relationship you had with him? 
Um, well, the, the relationship really helped in the book a lot. I mean, he was I mean, he was kind of a cantankerous guy, and and uh, you know, there might be days when. Um, you know, he, he if he if he was uh, in the wrong mood, then instead of an interview, he might just you know yell at you or something. But but generally, uh, he was he was very um, cooperative and and uh, he was a great storyteller. You know, he was a professor for all these years, a really compelling figure, um, a great speaker, uh, and you know, motivated for students. And and even when I knew him, when he was kind of later in his life, he really still had that. So he was he he was uh, just would always want to kind of dig back into his past and, t- and tell stories and, you know, tell me how it should be. And, and his, uh, one of his, his mantras was you got to get naked. If you're going to be a writer, you have to, you have to bare your soul and, and you, there's, there's no hiding anything. So, you know, for a, someone who's writing a biography, that's a pretty good uh, mantra for your subject to have because he really wanted to, to tell me everything. So it, it worked out for me. Gotcha. So for uh, for like cultivating you know the uh, cultivating everything into uh, one ball so to speak, what would you say that you, the readers should be taking from this? Like, uh, what do you what do you want them to take from this? Uh, well, uh, what I would really like to have happen would would be for um, another generation to discover the writing of Harry Cruz. I mean, he was uh, in his day. He he really. Uh, he wasn't the biggest name in in, in uh, literature, but he had a, a really strong following. The people that that like his work uh, are are completely dedicated to him. So, um, but you know, he's he's been gone for a while now, and he hasn't he hasn't published a novel in 15 or 20 years, and he has you know died four years ago. So, uh, you know, there's a tendency for uh, writers, if 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 um, no one champions them, to kind of drift off into history. So. Uh, you know, this uh, with the publication of the biography, a lot of people have um, who who used to like him are, are kind of remembering him, and and uh, his name is is going to be out there, and and a lot of his books have been out of print for for years and years, especially his early books. So so I'm hoping that um, maybe that gets rectified, some of his work gets back into print, and he really uh, ends up going down, uh, you know, into the the history of southern literature and takes his rightful place okay yeah i i uh personally am uh, am unf- unfamiliar with them so what i'll do is i'll make sure I'll definitely make sure to take a look at all the different writings and all the things that i find with my own research uh and um uh definitely promote what i find Oh yeah, that would be great. That you know, that's what I'm hoping for. That uh, I think people. I mean, he, his work still uh, it doesn't seem dated or, or dusty or anything. You know, it's still it's, it's really vibrant and and um, a lot of his work is still optioned to screenwriters and and filmmakers. So um, you know, there, there's a potential that you know even beyond this biography, he'll, he'll one of you know one or two of his novels will be filmed and and uh so i think he you know his his name i don't think is going to fade away ted did you get a chance thank you very much oh sorry no i'm sorry i didn't interrupt um ted did you get a chance to um share any of this with him before he passed away did he get to see any of the the stuff you put together uh, no, he never saw anything that I wrote. So I had, um, I mean, he saw the the all my, the, my newspaper articles that I wrote on him. He, uh, he was aware of that. Um, but uh, I started writing the biography um, in 2010, and you know, really was interviewing him. And I went, I went to uh, to see him, you know, uh, many times in that the last year or so. And uh, but I hadn't really written anything. Um, I kind of wrote it in the year after he died, and year and a half after he died. So, um, but he was he was behind the project. He always uh, he was even before he was published. He was aware that he wanted to have a literary rep, uh, reputation. That he was kind of writing for his time, but he was also writing for history. I mean, early on, he was saving letters that he had you know, was writing to, to agents and other writers and that sort of thing, even before he was published. So. Uh, he was he was uh, behind the the effort to to do a literary biography on him. Oh, great! Well, fantastic. Where's the best place we can purchase your book and learn more about you? Where can we go? Uh, well, you can go to uh, bloodboneandmarrow.com dot com or tedgeltner.com, dot com, and uh, both of those websites have links to um, where you can purchase the book. Uh, 
and um, a lot more information on there about about his career and all and all of his books. And uh, you know, once once hopefully um, you know a publisher picks up uh, his backlist and does it, then then uh, that's another place where you can you know you can go to those websites and that will be publicized there as well. All right. Well, fantastic. Thanks for calling. I appreciate you uh, uh, stopping by and take care. Hey, well, thanks for having me on and I enjoyed it. All right. It was fun. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. You're listening to Author's Corner, powered by Life Improvement Radio, live from the Mind Book Fair. And we'll be back in just a moment. We're live at the Miami Book Fair, powered by Life Improvement Radio, Authors Corner. You can check me out on Twitter, at Total Tutor, and also t- at Total Radio Net, and Neil Has Haley Facebook, neilhaley.com. And I have my co-host, Eric Remmel, Life Improvement Radio, and Peter Elvidge, my co-host, personal assistant, and also social media manager. And we want to jump right to this guest. Uh, so I'm excited to welcome the program, author Ali Etrez author of Native Believer, a novel. Ali, thanks for calling. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's kind of jump in, really, because we do have a little bit more time, a little bit of your background, and then we'll get right into the novel. Sure. Yeah, what is your background? What, like, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and all that. Oh, yeah. All right, let me take out my sheet. Um, well, I, um, I came to the United States in, in 1991 and, from Pakistan, and, uh, well, it, you know, it was a long road to becoming a writer, but it kind of just happened on its own. I originally was a lawyer. Um, and uh, during, I guess, the uh, post-9-11 period, um, I was originally actually writing a blog, and uh, it sort of morphed into um, the first book that I wrote called Children of Dust. It was a memoir about growing up in Pakistan and uh, coming to the United States and uh, sort of the role of Islam and um, Islamic uh, communities in, in the Pakistani American diaspora. And um, after that, I kind of went away for a little bit trying to figure out if I wanted to continue with the writing thing. And I ended up publishing this book, Native Believer, um, uh, this year with, um, with the press in New York. And, uh, you know, it's done fairly well in terms of reception. And it's um, become more and more timely in both unfortunate and fortunate ways. Uh, because of some of the issues about being a post-9-11 uh, uh, second-generation immigrant uh, and the topics that it covers with respect to that. All right. So when you're first, uh, when you're first starting to uh, write the book, uh, what types of challenges did you, did you uh, encounter, and how did that kind of shape how the book was written? Um, well, there's obviously, you know, the, the literary and personal challenges that come uh, across and maybe sometimes coincide and intersect in many ways. Uh, but one of the challenges that um, exists for um, minority writers and, and particularly minority Muslim uh, American writers is that there's not a lot of precedent uh, that exists. So you can't really see what other people have done. and kind of take guidance from it, um, and in many ways that creates this sense of dislocation. You know, how, how are you supposed to speak about things that in, in literary ways have not been spoken about? 
And um, on that front, you kind of have to um, accept that you're doing something brand new. And um, having said that, uh, I have gained, I gained a lot of guidance from you know African American writing in particular, uh, especially for this book. Uh, in fact, the title uh, is sort of gives uh, deference to uh, Native Son by by Richard Wright. So that is kind of how I overcame that challenge. Well, great. Uh, I applaud you for overcoming that challenge and, and putting your book out there and having a voice. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, appreciate that. There, there's been a lot of uh, negativity in the press as of late with, you know, election cycle and all these different things. How's been, how's been the reception with the book? Do you see it's kind of trending because of what's going on in, in the news media cycles and things like that? Or um, how's it been received? Uh, I, I haven't sort of done the link, uh, explicit linkage between what the book is about and what's happening in the media and, uh, and, 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 and society at large. I, I think that on many levels, um, you know, we, we tend to treat our art as product and so forth, and then if the, the moment is right, you're supposed to promote the product. But I've always kind of taken a more um, deferential approach to the reader, uh, it's it's really the reader who is uh, ultimately, frankly, accountable for whether or not they access the correct books or the books that are timely. And it's a decision that they make. And sometimes the world is moving too fast for them to uh, approach certain books. So uh, I, while I can certainly say that there is a connection between the topics in this book with respect to the war on terror, with respect to you know, as one character calls um, uh, the internment of the soul. Uh, there's still uh, a, a gap between the reader making that connection and then connecting it with society at large, and that's something that takes time, which <laughs> has to happen organically, I think. And, and definitely, I think that the organically, you're using uh, this book not at using it as a platform to speak about what's happening. You're more looking at specifically the immigration process that Muslims have had to gone through to the West and the challenges that they have to go through. Just because of specific political changes, this doesn't have to relate to what of why you've written the book. It's a, something to talk about, right, Ali, but it's not something that is um, a major focus for you based on the book, right? I think that um, that's where sort of the um, role of the novelist and, and fiction writer comes in because um, there are people who are going to be much better at speaking about smaller, quicker, faster local things than us. Uh, and, and on many level, um, I have to keep a broader perspective, uh, and, and, and that's my role like, in, my, in some ways. Uh, the, the the main character of the book, uh, you know, when I wrote the novel, it, it it didn't start out as having, frankly, any relevance to the world at large. For me, it was right. um, this marriage that you know is at at the heart of the book, and and sort of the illness that uh, they're confronting together, um, and in the main character, um, so definitely acquires uh, things about society. And from society that we recognize, you know, his his sort of um, double-mindedness about his role in the United States and his life in the United States, and of course his, the stresses he feels being a Muslim American uh, in denial in his case. Uh, but those things kind of came out as a result of me wanting to graft, you know, more meat around the bones of that original marriage that you know was at the heart of the that is at the heart of the book. <clears throat> That's a great point that you're that for sure, and what you're uh, doing. What do you feel uh, in from uh, this process can help in a way for people to understand why the, the the immigration to the West is an important part of of some people who want this opportunity in the United States. They've chosen yeah. just like yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's such a that's such an amazing like topic because. We, it's funny, like looking back in the early 90s when we came here, we came with a huge sense of optimism, and we had been waiting to come here all through the 80s. Um, and the amount of, like, 
longing is actually the right word. The amount of longing it we invested in coming to the United States, like why did we do that? Yes. Like what was it that was compelling us to want to do that, right? And that's this, this American dream that we, the United States, have been selling to the rest of the world for uh, 150 years. And the question that uh, immigration raises is, like, was that a lie? Was that something that we were just saying because we wanted to get cheaper labor here and get people to come and do our jobs for less? Or was that really something that we believe in as a principle, was that we are a place where you can come and make something of yourself uh, through through your, you know, hard work? Like, that was the one thing that we were taught, is that you go to the United States, you work hard, and there's something to be had. Um, now, through through the 25 years that I've been here, I was a kid when I came, so I, I this is all I know. Um, I've heard things that undermine that notion of uh, the American dream, w w the fact that we are the most unequal state of all the developed states, and we are developing dynast political dynasties and stuff like that. Um, it's troubling uh, on, on many levels. So what what we mean by immigration and how we continue to define it, I think, will define our country uh, just as it has for exactly. the last 50 years. And, and Ali, I think that that's a good point. I, I, I interviewed uh, Congress, the former congressman Dick Gephardt and someone else yep. and talked about the story of four immigrants and how they were able to make success in the United States. And if that was the tone of what we're trying to do is opening up our country, the way they wrote that book, Ali, that we would be in much better shape than we are today. And so I, I, my belief is America is the place for opportunity. Let's allow opportunity for everyone and for you to embrace America and that hope in that way and why people moved to immigrated to the West. We need to continue that. We can't have the fear and all that stuff. Go ahead, Peter, with a question. Yeah. So, uh, from, from either your experience or from research, uh, what do you think uh, is the biggest challenge facing young Muslims growing up in America? Um, on many levels, I think that there is – it used to be – I used to have a different answer a long time ago, but um, – and at that point, the answer was uncertainty about who they are. But I think that that's actually gone away, and it's really now – and people have figured out who they are. Like, they have figured out what it means to be an American Muslim and civic participation and, you know, military participation and edu uh, education and activism and all of that, even involvement in politics and media and writing and all. People have figured that out. And now I think what it means is fear, which is, you know, such a sad thing to say because you would think that with more participation there would be lesser fear, but – I think that as people have become more uh, participating in the system, they've also seen sort of the dark side and, and how things can uh, take a wrong turn. Um, and, and I guess on some level, uh, Native Believer is about that fear, uh, about this notion that um, perhaps something is brewing. And, and, and you know, during the campaign, uh, the Donald Trump campaign, uh, there was one moment when um, he used the word Americanism, and and in my book, many like year and many years ago, um, the, one of the characters expresses. Uh, it was published this year, but it was written a few years back. And one of the characters expresses this idea of Americanism. If if we are going to this place where we're trying to define America in this kind of unilateral way, this monolithic way, like there is an Americanism and this is what it means, I think that's going to be a huge problem and it's going to induce fear in any group that is not able to define that word, any minority group. Of, of course, because there's, 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 there's so many of us with different aspects of life, there's different aspects of physical appearances, and it's just, I, I love I love the, having the diversity. I feel bad when, when groups get single, singled out for either the way that other people are acting or the way that they look or the, the different ways of life, I just feel that's, inju that's injustice. And I just, you know, I, I understand completely. Yeah, that's the injustice in many ways that uh, uh, the protagonist of the book is grappling with is like what happens when that act of injustice happens to you? 
you know, you're just leading a normal life, and then, bam, something has gone and occurred. And I think on many levels, you know, it happens on a daily basis, uh, and people react, um, in my opinion, often with a great deal of resolve and patience, but uh, sometimes they don't. And, um, and in this book, in some ways, is exploration, not so much of um, how they mess some things up, but how long-term it can affect their relationship. Thank you. All right. Oh, Eric, uh, we have one more question you can ask, and then you could ask him also for his information because we're going to have to get to the next offer. So yeah, that was just the last real, question. Yeah. Just real quick. I mean, you just mentioned Donald Trump and some of the things that are going on, you know, after um, this election cycle. Do you have any future works? Like, has anything spurned from that to maybe write a future book on the topic and, and kind of continue along the storyline? That's funny. You're not the first person to ask me that on a radio show, which is pretty interesting. Um, I, I feel like... Um, it's, it's hard to be a reactive uh, writer. It's hard to just say, you know, I am now going to go and, like, make fun of these people or I'm not going to. It, it takes, for me, it definitely takes a longer period of brewing to understand uh, something and, um, and speak to it. So I, I don't really have anything that responds to it, and I probably never will. You know, I'll never be able to link it so explicitly to any one thing um, we are in the society and, and, and times that we are in now, and, you know, we're going to do the best that we can with um, the tools that we have, but I don't have anything expressively about, you know, speaking about those things. I think nonfiction actually serves a better role uh, in that capacity. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time, and, I mean, it's just a, a great message, and, you know, hats off to you with all your success and talking about this tough subject. So thank you again. If, that, if anyone wants having- no, you're most welcome. If anyone wants to contact you by your book, reach out to you in social media, what's the best way to do so? Um, my website is actually probably the best place. It's aliyataraz.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter and social media, but I can kind of get bored of that. So uh, website that has my contact information. And such. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for calling, and then take care. You're listening to Author's Corner live from the My Book Fair, and we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own and shall not be construed in any way as advice from Life Improvement Radio. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our website. Personal perspectives expressed by the producers, writers, or editors will always be presented as such. Any rebroadcast or retransmission without the expressed written consent of Life Improvement Radio is strictly prohibited. Thanks for listening.